Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to Strange Things with Chris James, broadcasting from the auxiliary radio station for Arkansas Radio in Laredo, Texas. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Here we are, a good set of footsteps into 2021, and I haven't seen Godzilla on the horizon. A uh, tornado hasn't touched down in my backyard yet, and so far as I can tell, Mexico hasn't invaded. Tonight's show will be on Lewis Deathwind Wetzel. Now, John Howard sent me the link for tonight's show. Uh, 2020 was a weird year. It is the year that all others will be compared to. Anytime anything bad happens, folks will say, well, yeah, but it's not as bad as 2020. That's just a giant comet that touched down in the middle of the Pacific, but it's not as bad as 2020. November 18th, 2020, state biologists of the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources were in the southeastern Utah carrying out a survey of bighorn sheep from a helicopter when one of the biologists spotted a pillar and asked the pilot to fly over the location again so he could have a better look. The Utah Department of Public Safety posted a photo of a pillar on Instagram. November 23rd, the DPS released videos and photographs of this weird object, but not its exact location. The pillar was in an out-of-the-way place that uh, would have led to many accidents had people tried to go out there to have a look at it. Might have been a few deaths as well. It was a pretty, pretty remote location. A curiosity will often outweigh people's common sense when dealing with life. The monolith was installed by unknown individuals in a red sandstone slot canyon in Lockhart Basin on public land. The site has no public services such as parking, restrooms, or cell phones. It didn't take long for somebody to figure out where this monolith was by using Google Earth and following the helicopter's flight path. Within 48 hours of the DPS's announcement, members of the public had reached the site and uploaded photographs and videos of the monolith to social media. Local businesses feared a surge in foot traffic could damage local Native American sites and artifacts. The metal structure stood about 9 feet 8 inches tall, with each of the sides being 23 inches wide. It was a three-sided structure, making it a triangular tower. The object was not magnetic, and it appeared to be made out of 1 8 inch aluminum sheets joined with rivets. It had a hollow interior. There was silicone caulking, or epoxy, along the base, and the Striking of the metal produced a dampened sound, which indicated that it may be packed with insulation. Dave Sparks, better known as Diesel Dave, from the TV show Diesel Brothers, went out to the monolith and he described it in a video he posted on Instagram. They got a concrete saw and they cut it into the red rock. You can see right here on the bottom where they had a couple of overcuts with the saw. Yes, I watch the Diesel Brothers anytime it's on. It's amazing what those guys can do with a vehicle, especially when it's a diesel. I really like that electric mini bike they built. It went from something like 0 to 200 miles an hour in a second. That had to have been an exciting ride. 
Wendy Wisher of the University of Utah School of Fine Arts said, One person alone could not have done it, so there is a group of people who have some knowledge of it somewhere. Most artists want some recognition for what they are doing, but this seems to include a level of humor and mystery as a part of the intention. On first discovering the pillar, the DPS described it as a monolith, a term since repeated by other major media outlets. The word monolith refers to a single great stone. The word has also become closely associated with the monolith from the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, to which the Utah monolith bears circumstantial resemblance. The Utah Division of the Bureau of Land Management said they received reports of the monolith had been removed on the evening of November 27, 2020, by an unknown party. Later, they said the people who removed the structure were a group of Moab-based recreationists. As several adventure photographers posted details and pictures about the dismantling and the removal of the, the structure. One witness reported that four men pushed the monolith over while onlookers watched, saying, This is why you don't leave trash in the desert. The object was broken into pieces and carried away in wheelbarrow. The group referred to the conservationists' ethic of leave no trace. The photos of the site posted by visitors show all that was left as a triangular metal piece embedded in the ground. Witnesses reported seeing a pickup truck driving away from the site carrying an object as they approached. So was it a wheelbarrow or was it a pickup? Odd how something as simple as removing a small tower can generate so many different stories. Well, people began to get mad. How dare somebody destroy such an artistic thing? The guys who claim to have taken the monolith posted images claiming the monolith is now standing in one of their backyards. Is this the same art piece or a replica? The witnesses said the tower was destroyed and not just lifted away. I, for one, would have just left the thing where it was. It looked kind of neat, and it wasn't really trash. It was just a metal thing in the middle of nowhere. To add to the mystery, a similar-looking monolith appeared in Romania within 24 hours of the Utah disappearance. Another 10-foot-tall monolith was found standing on a mountain of rocks at the bottom of the decom decommissioned Pinawa Dam in Manitoba. That would be in Canada. One day it was there, and the next it was gone as well. This was followed by a monolith being found in Atascadero, California. Then, two more monoliths were found in Poland. One of the structures was in Poland's southern city of Kalise, at the site of a former quarry turned into a nature preserve. The second was found on the banks of the Vistula River in Warsaw. Then the UK, a monolith turned up on the top of Glastonbury Tor, a hill in Glastonbury, England. The BBC reported that the structure spotted on Wednesday had the words, Not Banksy etched on it. Anybody know what not Banksy might have meant? Forgot to look it up. A people came forward saying they were responsible for making and taking these weird structures. I put the monolith mystery right up there with crop circles. Weird, but maybe explainable. The big question is, are all these structures being made by people as some kind of a worldwide joke, or are there one or two of them with other purposes, and folks playing the joke are muddying the water for the rest of us? Today, anybody finding a three-sided structure in some remote location will ignore it, thinking it's just a part of the prank. 
Let's just hope there isn't something sinister hidden in with the fun. Uh, someone once asked why ghost sightings are always in old, musty places, and the spirits are always from long ago. <clears throat> this person didn't keep up with many of the sightings people have had. The LPRS investigated the Laredo Arena several years ago. There is a ghost woman hanging out on the second tier. as She has been seen by many of the workers late at night. They see her enter the ladies' room. This is followed by the sound of the toilet flushing, and then a sink being turned on and off. There's no one in that bathroom. The woman looks like any ordinary person you'd see hanging out in town. The staff see her enter, but she never comes back out. The arena isn't very old. It was built in 2001. The ghost my wife and I saw looked like he belonged at the hospital right up until he vanished. A people might see a ghost and think it's just some person. As long as there's nothing to put the thought of him or her being a ghost, how would anyone know? As some people think a ghost is going to look like something out of Hollywood. The ghost of the little girl seen all over Laredo looks like any child. She looks real. She walks around and those who see her would never suspect anything paranormal except she's dressed in old style clothing. The clothes are what make people think something is odd. When the little girl vanishes, people realize she's a ghost. So the person asking about the ghosts being long dead folks seen in old buildings is basing their thought on when people see something that stands out from everyone else. It's the clothes that make the ghost. More like the clothes that make people think ghost. George Washington's ghost is said to haunt one or more of many historic buildings, but most of the stories are concentrated on his home in Mount Vernon, though some claim to see him in Gettysburg as well. Uh, people report seeing a tall, well-dressed man clothed in the early 19th century garb. He looks like one of many paintings seen all over our country. If you see somebody dressed in the style of clothing from back then, it isn't all that hard to say... You saw George. Alexander Hamilton is one of only two people who were never a U.S. president, but appear on our currency today. He's on the $10 bill. His ghost has been seen in the house where he died, 27 Jane Street in Greenwich Village, New York City. In this case, the ghost is being identified by the location of the sightings. Hamilton's ghost seems to be fascinated by modern technology, and since the owner reports poltergeist-like activity around anything electronic or new. <coughs> General Anthony Wayne was one of the most successful, brilliant, and legendary leaders of the Continental Army. His bold tactics and willingness to go on the offensive against the superior numbers and better equipped British troops earned him a reputation that was unfortunately cut short by illness. A few years after he had been buried, his bones were dug up and transported along what is now Route 322 so they could be reinterred in the family plot at Radnor, Pennsylvania. Legend says some of Wayne's bones were lost in transit, falling to the sides of the road. Each year, January 1st, the general's birthday, his ghost is seen searching along Route 322 for his missing parts. Now, people see a ghostly figure on the side of the road and they say that this must be the general. This apparition is said to look like what most folks would think a ghost should look. A drafters of the Declaration of Independence and influential philosopher 
multilingual and political theorist Thomas Jefferson, who wound up on the $2 bill, when's the last time you had one of those? I've got two. Yeah, they're in bad shape, but still, they're $2 bills. A Jefferson seems to still be attached to the land he dedicated his life to. Outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, stands Jefferson's self-designed plantation, Monticello. His ghost still walks around asking people what they're doing on his land. People also report hearing whistling, which was something Jefferson was known to do. If you see a ghost at Monticello, it must be Jefferson. Paranormal activity is linked to whatever stories people can find. If somebody dies at a particular location, then any ghost seen must be that person. Some ghosts are identified by the way they look. George Washington is a good example since everybody knows what he looked like. The ghost of the little girl is based on how she looks. The same age, same dress, but she's seen all over town. I spent months digging through old archives looking for anything connected to a seven to nine year old girl with dark brown hair who passed away in our area. I found nothing. This doesn't mean she didn't live and die here. Many of the records are missing. Some are hidden away in boxes, somewhere. The people at the mall call her Ashley, for their own reasons. The people working at the health department call her La Nina. Most of us just call her the little girl. There doesn't have to have been a death in a building for it to be haunted, like the arena. Some spirits just decide to move in. We call this a transient spirit. Then again, just because somebody or several folks died in a location doesn't mean there has to be a ghost. The trenches of World War I are relatively uninhabited by any ghosts. Researchers are surprised by the lack of activity. No one is sure where Louis Wetzel was born. They think he might have been from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and he may have been born in 1752, or perhaps on the south branch of the Potomac River, where his parents had moved before 1770. Lewis was the son of Mary Bonnet and John Wetzel, who had both emigrated from Friedrichstahl, Baden, Germany. The Wetzel and Bonnet families moved to the Welling Creek area in what is now the northern panhandle of West Virginia. The area was also the home to the Zane, McCulloch, Eberly, Rosencrantz, and other pioneer families. Settlements in this area were illegal, according to a treaty made by the British, ending the French and Indian War. The Treaty of Fort Stanwix, signed in 1768, made the Iroquois, who were the traditional enemies of the Shawnee and other tribes of the area, led many pioneers to try westward settlement. To them, this land was uninhabited, and so they tried moving in. As each European country claimed power in the colonies, they would make agreements with the locals and use them to force other tribes to leave the area or face being wiped out. Most of the Indians living in the Americas were amicable towards the settlers taking land for farming. Oh, there were hostiles in some parts who considered all outsiders to be fair game. Many Indian tribes were at war with each other long before the Europeans moved in. Many of the settlers considered the locals to be the lost tribes of Israel, and they tried to either convert them to Christianity or simply live and learn from them. There were some settlers who feared the Indians. Some saw them as being in the way of progress. Looking different and acting different was a sure sign of communing with evil spirits. 
So many people had come to Americas from so many different countries and had such different views, the Indians would have found it confusing trying to adjust to some of these new neighbors. There were no law enforcement entities to keep the peace. If somebody got out of hand, it was left up to the town folks to deal with any troublemakers. Anyone could claim there had been something stolen by an Indian and churn up the neighbors into thinking it was time to attack instead of waiting to find out who was really to blame. As some government officials would sign a treaty with one of the Indian chiefs. Then new people would move into the area who either didn't understand the language or hadn't heard about this agreement. This would lead to run-ins that would lead to violent encounters. Many of the folks coming from Europe didn't know the difference between a Shawnee or a Miami. The Shawnee were friendly and accepted the settlers as their neighbors. The Miami were unwilling to allow anybody, including other Indians, to live in the area. Misinformation accompanied by a lack of communication led to many nasty situations. The Indians eventually came out on the bottom. The Wetzel family settled in a fairly isolated location near the Ohio River, about 14 miles from Fort Henry. A Fort Henry had been built on the confluence of the Welling Creek to protect settlers from hostile Indian raids. Despite the hardships of frontier living, uh, several Wetzel children survived to adulthood. A life was hard back then. If you broke your arm, it was up to somebody nearby to try to set the bone. If you were lucky, the bone would heal in a straight enough direction you would be able to continue working. Infection was nearly a death sentence. Uh, viruses and bacteria were killers. Food was questionable, since there was no really safe way of long-term storage. To be sure there were survival, survivors, a family would have as many kids as they could. With luck, half might live to their twenties. Moving into an area where no one lived, well, nobody from Europe, the settlers would first have to find a clear area to build. If there was no clearing, one would have to be made. Trees had to be cut down and drugged to the site. Everything was done by hand. The first house was usually a one-room building that served as kitchen, dining room, and bedroom. It was cold in the winter and hot in the summer. If you watch the show Barnwood Builders, you'll see how many examples of these old cabins Yes, I watch that show all the time. Would you believe Johnny Jett is 71 years old and he still works harder than most folks out there? He's also an artist. Very accomplished artist. As the family grew, they might build a second room, maybe an upstairs. The animals needed some place to get in out of the snow and ice, so a barn needed to be put up. Neighbors would gather to help put up the, the frame. Then the owner and his family would finish up whenever they had the time and the materials. As more and more land was being taken from the locals, tensions grew. The Indians would see one farm, followed by several, which led to the area being nearly overrun. Even though the farms might be miles apart, they were slowly taking over. The land hunted by the Indians for generations was vanishing. The atmosphere of the Ohio River Valley in the years before the American War for Independence featured atrocities committed on both sides by American settlers and Indians. Logan, or Tihagjut, geez, one of those names with too many letters in the wrong positions, Tagahujit. I'll go with that for now. Tagahujit was a Mingo chief who was known as a peaceful leader. A group of Indians raided a farming community and stole food and supplies. 
the settlers form a militia and began tracking the raiding party. Any Indians encountered were suspect. A Chief Logan's family were among those killed in 1773. A year later, Logan led Shawnee and Mingo raiders to the Clinch River settlement in Kentucky. They had a few minor successes, but eventually they were defeated. Logan, overwhelmed with a desire for vengeance, refused to surrender. Then, the execution of Chief Cornstalk in 1777 at Fort Randolph led to attacks on the forts in the area. Fort Randolph was built on the confluence of the Ohio Kanawha Rivers. Today, the area is known as Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where the Mothman first became known. Louis Wetzel's older brother, Martin, was a friend of Daniel Boone and Simon Kenton. He had helped his father fight Indians in the Battle of Point Pleasant in 1774, and he helped defend Fort Henry in 1777 and 1782. A rifle was good for long-distance fighting. Close in, it was more of a club than a firearm. One of the favorite frontier weapons was a tomahawk. If you watch the movie The Patriot, you know what I'm talking about. A Jacob Wetzel helped construct a wagon road in central Indiana after fighting Indian wars in western Pennsylvania and the Northwest Territory with Kenton under General Arthur St. Clair and William Henry Harrison. The Wyandot were Huron Indians who had dispersed south from Canada into the Ohio country by the time of the Revolution. They were strong, aggressive allies of the British, and they were formidable frontier partisan warriors. In 1777, Louis Wetzel, then 13, and his brother Jacob, age 11, were handed their father's rifle, a bag of shot, and a powder horn, and they were sent out to tend the family fields in an isolated section of Welling Creek. The rest of the family was at home when the Huron began to attack farms in the area. The family packed their bags and ran for the fort, along with all of their neighbors. While they were tending their land, the several Indians surrounded the boys and captured them. Lewis was injured during the scuffle. A bullet fired by one of the Indians had grazed Lewis across the chest. One of the Indians treated the wound, basically saving his life. The two boys eventually were able to escape, but Lewis developed a hatred of his captors that followed him through his years. Within a year, Lewis had expressed extreme belligerence and had begun to enact violent actions while participating in several counter-raids against the Ohio Indians. He began to be known for taking scalps. When I was young, I was told that scalping had been taught to the Indians by the colonists. The soldiers fighting the British would pay cash for the white wigs worn by the British officers. Well, actually, scalping was practiced long before the Europeans arrived in the New World. And it wasn't just the locals who did such things. A scalping was practiced all over the world. It was a way of showing how many of your enemy you had vanquished without having to carry their heads around. By his mid-teens, Wetzel was an expert woodsman and a formidable forest warrior. He was exceptionally athletic, standing about 5 foot 10 inches, and he was very well built. An average height back then was 5 foot 6. He was renowned for being a fast runner, which would serve him well in his encounters with his foes. His brothers, Jacob and Martin, were also known for their physical abilities. In 1781, Colonel Daniel Broadhead IV reached the main Turtle Clan village of 
Oh, I'm not even going to try that one. G-E-K-E-L-M-U-K-P-E-C-H-U-N-K. Give it a shot if you feel lucky. Today, this area is known as the Newcomer Town, Ohio. He requested a peaceful discussion between the main chiefs of the village and th three were sent out to meet him. He was hoping to secure the villagers' allegiance and enlist new warriors in his campaign. Well, Louis Wetzel's younger brother Martin attacked one of the peaceful chiefs with a tomahawk coming up from behind, killing him just as he had crossed the river. A fearing massive losses and an unplanned battle, Broadhead retreated and instead refocused his troops on their initial goal of reaching Koshkaton. And with that horribly sounding word, I will take a brief pause and drink some commercial and play some commercials. So don't go away. We'll be right back after this. Did you stay up all night watching horror movies and now you think your house might be haunted? Contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society and have them come by and check out your house. Maybe you accidentally invited a ghost or a spirit, or maybe it's just the plumbing. You can contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society at LaredoParanormal at Hotmail.com. I had no idea what I was missing until I had my eyes checked at the Optica del Norte 107 Kyle del Norte. Now I can see all kinds of things I'd been missing my entire life. You should get your eyes checked too. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. Isn't it about time you did something for your skin besides mistreat it? Contact Lourdes James at 956-723-3019 and take care of your skin with a free skincare class. This is Arkanasa Radio you've been listening to. Kind of limited in the music I can play on the show since whatever music is on YouTube, it has to be public domain. And there's a lot of public domain music out there, but some of it's really icky so you might notice that a lot of my commercials have the same background music well that's so i don't get a nasty gram from the folks at youtube in 1786 four of the wetzel family members were on a hunting trip as they rode their canoes along the river indians attacked john wetzel the father and his son george were hit by rifle fire Martin and Lewis were able to row out of rifle range. Martin was hit, but he survived his wounds. The wound made him hate Indians as much as his brother. Lewis's sister, Christina, died in another raid, 1786. As seeing members of his family die led to Lewis hating Indians more than ever and his eventual decision to become an Indian fighter. At some point in his life, Wetzel became known as Death Wind. Wetzel later participated in several military campaigns against Native American tribes in the Ohio region. 
He claimed to have taken 27 or 37 Indian scalps. He preferred to operate alone. Military procedure didn't suit him, even while serving with the militia. He became renowned for an ability to load his rifle while on the move. A muzzle loader is usually loaded while the butt sits on the ground. You have to pour in the powder, ram the bullet into the barrel, prime the pan, all while standing up. Wetzel was able to do all of this while on the run. He would keep a few bullets in his mouth for easy access. The lead probably caused some mental problems over the years. The lead poisoning affects both the mind and the body. Lewis Wetzel really hated Indians. It got to a point he went looking for somebody to kill. Today, he'd have been called a serial killer or a sociopath. He was implicated in the deaths of many several, <laughs> many several, many friendly Indians. That's not too redundant. I used to re work for the Department of Redundancy and Repetition Department. Something the government would come up with. He may have killed some of them while they were asleep. The government had a tendency to look the other way any time the victims were locals. Many of the settlers didn't have an issue with the Indians, but the noisy ones were so vociferous that they tended to turn the tide against the Indians. The most famous incident that turned public opinion against Wetzel involved the Seneca chief Tegunte. The American soldiers called him George Washington because of his upright character. The chief was traveling to Fort Harmer, near present-day Marietta, Ohio, in 1788. Wetzel ambushed, shot, and scalped Tegunte on an isolated path. The dying chief survived long enough to identify his attacker. Wetzel readily admitted to the deed on November 6th to jo uh, Colonel Joshua, no, Josiah Harmer, bragging, I'll shoot them all down like the worthless dogs they are as long as I live. The guy was showing just how twisted some folks can become. Wetzel escaped by sprinting away through the woods. He was recaptured two weeks later, but managed to escape before his trial by clubbing his jailer with his chains. Once more, Wetzel was arrested in mid-December near Maysville, Kentucky, and he was taken to Fort Washington, which is now Cincinnati. A 200-man mob, led by Kenton, threatened to destroy the fort, so Colonel Harmer released Wetzel. There was no justice for the Indians. Wetzel was not only released, but he went back to doing what he liked, hunting down people and killing them. The Indians feared the coming of Deathwind. He became a living legend. The future president, James Madison's brother, John Madison, died in an attack near the Kanawha River while on a seven-month expedition with Wetzel as his scout. Some accounts claim that Lewis and Clark asked Wetzel to join their expedition. This may just be speculation. There's no record of either explorer actually asking Wetzel to join them. Either following a suspended death sentence, or for killing peaceful Indian in 1791, or perhaps because the Indians had all left the Ohio Valley following the 1795 Treaty of Greenville, Wetzel decided to relocate to the Louisiana Territory, and then eventually he moved to New Orleans, where he got arrested and spent several years in prison for counterfeiting. Wetzel kept mostly to himself, living away from others, but would sometimes return to his home. On one such visit, he heard rumors of a strange, ghostly turkey call coming from the high hills in the area. The folks in the region were constantly being harassed by the sound, leaving everybody uneasy. Men who went out to check it out 
perhaps bag a turkey for a meal, never came back. As more men disappeared pursuing this phantom turkey, Wetzel decided to check out this mysterious and supernatural bird for himself. Before sunrise, Wetzel snuck through the trees, and he managed to get close to where the sound was reported coming from. Once the sun was up, he scouted the trees, spotting an Indian hiding in a cave above the town. Wetzel got close enough to kill the man. He must have been right because no one mentioned the hearing the turkey call after that, and nobody went missing in the area. None of the hunters that went out into the brush were ever harassed by the phantom turkey again. Well, Lewis decided to start inhabiting this cave for himself. Lewis Wetzel spent the remainder of his days in solitude, staying away from people and hiding out in rock outcrops and caves like the one near Hempfield Tunnel, where the legendary turkey call story began. He let his hair grow real long. Lewis said this way, if the Indians ever managed to kill him, they could scalp him much easier. And it's not... the. <laughs> And it is this very cave that is said to be haunted by Lewis Wetzel's ghost. A lonely apparition hovering nearby. His voice has been heard inside the cave, along with others who have hidden within its confines over the years. Accounts about his final years vary. He had no known children, although several of his siblings did have children and some of them were named in his honor <clears throat> excuse me some of them were named in his honor most likely lewis wetzel died in 1808 in natchez mississippi at the residence of his cousin philip sykes since a skeleton matching wetzel's description including the long hair was exhumed along with a rifle and other equipment that sykes farmed the remains were reinterred in McCreary Cemetery in Marshall County, West Virginia. There was more than one Lewis Wetzel of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. One was a judge and a newspaper editor who was one of the founders of the state of West Virginia. This Wetzel was murdered by another pro-union founder named John Hall. Martin Wetzel's direct descendant, Robert Lewis Wetzel of Clarksbury, West Virginia, was a veteran of the Korean and Vietnam Wars. He rose to the rank of lieutenant general and corps commander during the Cold War. Wetzel County, West Virginia, was named for either him or his family, as is the Lewis Wetzel Wildlife Management Area. West Virginia has erected historical markers commemorating the Wetzel family near Limestone in Marshall County, and they specifically mention Lewis Wetzel on the markers for Fort Beeler and Terra Alta in Preston County. An Ohio historical marker notes Lewis Wetzel's involvement in the Broadhead Massacre of a group of peaceful Indians at the Moravian Mission. Zane Gray, the great Western novelist, wrote about Wetzel in his books. More recently, Alan W. Eckert recounted Wetzel's exploits in the Dark and Bloody River. A frontier warfare was brutal and brutalizing. Like Frederick Nietzsche said, when you look into an abyss, the abyss looks into you. Few men can go to war and return unchanged. Many of the native tribes allied themselves with the British during the American Revolution in a desperate attempt to stem the tide of white encroachment into their land in the Ohio Valley. It inaugurated a war of exceptional savagery and continued long after the Revolution was over. Soldiers who fought Indians during the Revolution would look upon anyone different from them with suspicion. The settlers coming to the New World would hear horror stories about attacks from Indians, many of which were vastly enhanced. 
A simple raid on a farm might turn into an all-out county-wide slaughter. Many so-named Indian fighters began to question what they were doing. Some even began to regret their actions. Well, Wetzel was not amongst them. He kind of had a taste for what he was doing. David, or Davy Crockett, as most know him, did become an Indian fighter. After an Indian attack on a frontier town, a Crockett joined Andrew Jackson and began hunting down the locals, thinking they might have been the ones who attacked. It didn't take long for Crockett to change his mind. He lost interest in fighting Indians. Manifest Destiny was a widely held cultural belief in the 19th century United States that American settlers were destined to expand across North America. Andrew Jackson was in favor of pushing every Indian out of the country so settlers could move in. Well, Crockett disagreed with Jackson, so Jackson did everything he could to get Crockett removed from Congress. Some folks use adversity as an excuse for bad behavior, while others use adversity to grow. The story goes that Wetzel was buried with his rifle because one relative said, a gun that has killed so many would have haunted any house it was kept in. Once he was in the ground, the Indians, who had heard of his demise, made pilgrimages to his gravesite. They would leave gifts for his spirit in the hopes they would keep him from coming back to wage war on them from the other side. Wetzel was dug up and reburied in Moundsville near his original homestead in 1942. He is still well known in that area. West Virginia named a county and a state highway after him. Once more, the Indians who heard the grave relocation went to his new grave to try to appease his spirits. I don't know how long this practice went on. There are varying reports. Lewis Wetzel's cave is in Willing, West Virginia. It's 704 feet above sea level, has a total surveyed length of 163 feet. The cave is located 124 feet southeast of Tunnel Green of the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad in East Welling. The five foot wide by four foot high entrance is in Sandstone Cliff and it reduces down to a crawl space of about two feet wide by two feet high. After 20 feet, the entrance passage intersects the main cave perpendicularly forming a T-shaped junction. Just to the right of the T-junction is a small room that is called the Indian Attic. It's 10 feet long by 9 feet wide with a ceiling height of 4 feet. At one point it passes right over the entrance. To the left of the T-junction lies the main portion of the cave. 12 feet long by 4 feet wide and 11 feet high. It's divided into a small upper level room and a stoopway which slopes downwards to the main room. The upper level is 8 feet long, 2 feet wide, and the ceiling is 3 feet high. You'd have to crawl into most of these spaces, but if you're in there to sleep or to sit and relax, you don't need a lot of headroom. The cave where Wetzel had lived after killing the turkey caller is still haunted by his spirit, or perhaps the spirits of those he had killed. The story goes that Wetzel killed at least ten others while in or around the cave. It is just above and to the right of the haunted Tunnel Green, which used to be a train tunnel but was turned into a walking trail. Right above the old train tunnel is a cemetery. Many say that the spirits of those buried in the cemetery haunt the tunnel today. Could the hauntings be from the Indians killed by Wetzel, or his proximity to the cemetery unleashing their ghosts? Wetzel was relocated, and some say if you dig up a body, you're asking for a ghost manifestation. The opening to Wetzel's cave is small, and it looks kind of squared off. 
Now, this was caused by the kind of rock that the cave is formed into. The cave runs back into the mountain before it opens up. Once in the back portion, the cave is big enough to stand up in and would have made a decent home for one person. Over the years, the floor of the cave has been covered in with washed-in dirt and mud. At one time, it may have been an easier place to maneuver in. Back in May, the Paranormal Quest folks went to have a look at the tunnel green, as well as Wetzel's cave. While doing an EVP session, one of them heard a voice coming from the back of the cave. The voice was heard while he was there, and just not on the tape. It was an actual audio occurrence. Unfortunately, they never were able to pick up the voice from the recorder. While doing some research in the tunnel below, they did pick up a voice saying, Happy, from one of their machines. The tunnel is open on both ends. This allows a lot of outside noise to come in. The cars driving by and airplanes flying over. It makes an investigation a lot more difficult. While visiting Point Pleasant, West Virginia, we stayed at an RV park that was right across the road from Fort Randolph. We were there to see the Mothman Museum, so we didn't go to the fort. It's amazing what you miss as you go through life, and then later you have nothing but regrets for not doing something. Had I been able to do it all over again, that sort of thing. Perhaps we'll go back to Point Pleasant and take a look at the fort as well. The cemetery that sits right above the Tunnel Green has its own bizarre story. There's a castle built on top of Mount Wood that sits unfinished. The huge structure became known as the castle. Had it been completed, it would have been almost exactly that, a mansion that looked like a European castle. A local doctor had decided to build this house for his wife back in 1925. Before construction was finished, the doctor was hauled away on federal drug trafficking laws. The foundation of the first and second stories were laid out, with a spiral staircase connecting the two. Once the doctor was locked away, the city of Welling bought the structure and named it Mount Wood Overlook, since it overlooks the entire city. The vandals have spray-painted the castle, while the local organization is hoping to restore it. The adjacent cemetery is one of the oldest in the area, with graves dating back to the 1700s. The graveyard speaks to Welling's history, as some of the first and most important families in the city are buried there. Other grave markers are so old that the inscriptions have been faded to history. Just a big cement or stone marker with no name and no dates. Welling was home to many millionaires and their mansions. They had more per capita than any other city in the U.S., but it was also the home to gangsters and tycoons. The castle and cemetery are what remains of Welling's fascinating past. It's 160 miles from Welling to Point Pleasant, West Virginia. That is a long way to travel by foot or horse. The Ohio River connects the two towns, making it a much easier trip for somebody back in the 1700s. In 2017, a research study was made at the Institute of Statistics and Dynamics of Aerospace Structures Institution, what a name, in Stuttgart, Germany. Professor Dr. Bernard Coplin and Regine C. Henschel, M.A., conducted an experiment where they recruited four students and gave each of them an eyedropper. They asked the students to each fill the dropper from the same glass of water. Afterwards, each student made four drops in a row on separate slides. When placed under a microscope, they found even though each student's drops of water were the same size, each student's drops were different from the other students. 
When the water came from the same glass, each student's energy had changed the droplets. What this experiment shows is that water is able to retain the power or essence of the human being. The water wasn't going anywhere, while the Ohio River is constantly flowing body. Paranormal activity seems to have some kind of electrical connection. Ghosts and spirits tend to drain batteries, making some folks feel drained and sleepy as well, and they are more prevalent during a thunderstorm. Water can be a good conductor of electricity, so it stands to reason that perhaps water can fuel a haunt. A flowing water has a lot of force, a lot of energy. The spirits need fuel, just maybe they're drawing from the moving water. The trouble is, we don't know. We can come up with all kinds of theories about ghosts and what they do or don't do, but until one sits down and tells us, we won't have any real information. Gettysburg is a town with many paranormal hotspots. Many of the more active spots are near water. A Spangler's Spring has always been an area of battlefield that has produced paranormal experiences and evidence. One of the best-known ghost stories of Gettysburg, The Lady in White, takes place at the spring. Bridges are also known for ghosts. There are several bridges in and around Gettysburg that are reputed to be haunted. A Sachs Bridge in Gettysburg, a Starner's Dam Bridge in Henry, Maryland, Utica Covered Bridge in Thurmond, Maryland, and Roddy Creek Bridge in Thurmond, Maryland, all have ghost stories associated with them. There's the Donkey Lady Bridge in San Antonio, the Goatman Bridge, the Pope Lick Monster, which hangs out under the bridge. There are so many ghost ships seen on the water, it makes me think there must be some kind of a link. We don't know the whole connection between spirits and water. Could the spirit of Lewis Wetzel be following the river to haunt the cave where he once lived? Or is it the direction of the river? He must have taken a canoe up and down that river on many occasions. Being a woodsman and an explorer, he would have known how to get from Point Pleasant to Welling. Then again, a ghost hanging out in the cave just might be some other spirit pretending to be Wetzel. Those who have done investigations in the cave have never gotten any real answers to their questions. When asked if the ghost of Wetzel is there, uh, sometimes a voice can be heard, but the words are unintelligible. Uh, sightings of Wetzel ghost are only associated with him if they're near the cave. Move down the river and people see a frontierman's ghost will say that they saw the ghost of either Daniel Boone or Davy Crockett. I dug as much as I could to find out about Lewis Wetzel and his hauntings. Many stories just might be legends based on rumors. The good old days really weren't all that good. Did he really kill as many people as they said he did, or was that just some very negative PR on the part of people that didn't like him? Was he really such a heroic guy, or was that just some of the good public relations put out by the people that liked him as well as his family. We may never know until somebody actually manages to sit down with the ghost of Lewis Wetzel and get him to answer the questions. Hope you liked tonight's show. If you did, tell your friends what they're missing. If you'd like to listen to all of the archives, you can find them on YouTube, but you have to type out the whole name. Strange Things with Chris James, because last time I checked there were about 12 other shows all called Strange Things. If you have any stories that you think might look good in a book, let me have them and I'll try to put them down in print. Send me your stories at strangethings at arcanasa.com. 
All I need is just the basic details and I'll try to put it into a readable format. Please, only true stories. Either things that happen to you or things that happen to your family or friends. Until next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree